Because the prosecutor has the burden of proof, they also have a right to rebuttal. Uh, you also will have a copy of the jury instructions at the end of the trial and when you're deliberating. Okay. Prosecutor? Good afternoon. On November 30th of 2021, around one o'clock in the afternoon, Lieutenant Tim Willis doesn't remember exactly what happened immediately upon being informed that there's a possible shooter at the Oxford High School. Doesn't really remember who he called or how he got down in the elevator, but he remembers one thing. Whoever he called, the first thing the caller said was, it's real. Doesn't really remember the details on how he got there that day. But he did tell you that of all the first responder scenes he's ever, ever experienced in his 20 plus years of, of being in law enforcement, this was the largest and most serious by far, and the second what didn't even come close. Ed Wagrowski, who is now works for the Secret Service, but was a, worked for the Sheriff's Office in the Computer Crimes Department, told you that he went so fast that he could barely keep his tires on the road. He, he told you that he will never forget the look on those kids' faces because they looked like zombies. He also told you that in that moment of crisis, he will never forget the looks on the parents' faces who are waiting desperately for their kid to get off those buses. Molly Darnell, a seasoned teacher who had years and years of training on what to do in an active shooter situation, she told you that even though she locked eyes with James, James Crumbly's son, when he fired his SIG 9mm at her and hit her, she still couldn't believe she was shot. She told you that she didn't even put it together when she felt the warmth and burning on her arm. She didn't even trust herself to recognize a voice she'd known for over 20 years outside the door. And you heard from Christy Gibson Marshall, an assistant principal, who had had hours and hours of training on what to do in an active shooting situation. And what did she do? She ran towards the shooter. She ran towards the shooter. All the training, all the preparation, and she did the opposite of what she was trained to do and what she tells everybody else to do. Because she couldn't believe it. And even when she saw James Crumbly's son with that gun, she still couldn't believe it. But she wasn't going to leave because Tate needed her help. All four of these individuals trained for years and years and years. Law enforcement, what to do in an active shooting situation. Yet, all four of them, all four of them, as experienced and trained as they were, had no idea how to accept the reality that this was happening. Which is why Lieutenant Willis remembers it's real. Ladies and gentlemen, those four people, they were adults. Those four trained, experienced people were adults. These four were children, and so were the hundreds of kids in that school. What happened that day is about the deaths of these four children and what James Crumbly did and what he didn't do. The shooter has been sentenced and prosecuted and convicted. He pulled the trigger. James Crumbly is not on trial for what his son did. 
James Company is on trial for what he did and what he didn't do. James Crumbly had a willful disregard of a known danger caused, and it caused the death of four students in Oxford High School on November 30th, 2021. Hannah, Madison, Tate, and Justin. I'm gonna spend a few minutes on the law with the judge is the authority on what the law is, and she's going to instruct you what the law is. He's charged with two counts of involuntary manslaughter under two alternative theories. You don't have to find both. You don't have to agree on both. You can agree on both, but either one is the only thing you're necessary to return a verdict of guilty. The first is that there was gross negligence in the performance of a legal, a lawful act, and that the defendant caused death, and in doing the act that caused death, he acted in gross negligence. negligence. And then the second is his failure to perform a legal duty, and that he knew about the facts that gave rise to the duty, and he willfully neglected or refused to perform that duty, and he failed to perform it, and it caused and it grossly negligent to human life and that the death of the victims were directly caused by defendant's failure to perform this duty. Four counts of involuntary manslaughter for children who were killed. There can be more than one cause of death. James Crumley doesn't get a pass because somebody else also caused the death of these four kids. And the judge will instruct you on that. It's not enough that he just made it possible for the deaths of Madison, Tate, Hannah, and Justin. You must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the deaths were the natural or necessary result of his acts or failure to act. You heard the evidence about how each of those kids were killed. And as previously noted, there's more, there can be more, one cause, more than one cause of death. In order to find that the death of Madison, Tate, Hannah, and Justin was caused by the defendant, you must also find beyond a reasonable doubt that his son's act of shooting someone was reasonably foreseeable. Not that he knew his son was going to kill four people. That is not what I have to prove just that it was reasonably foreseeable. What's gross negligence? It's more than carelessness. It's willfully disregarding the results to others that might follow from an act or failure to act. And in order to find that, you have to defend it with that, you have to find that defendant was grossly negligent, and you must find each of the following three, three things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that he knew of the danger to another. That is, he knew there was a situation that required him to take ordinary care to avoid injuring someone else. Second, that he could have avoided injuring another by using ordinary care. And third, that the defendant failed to use ordinary care to prevent injuring another one to a reasonable person, a reasonable person. And it must be apparent that the result was likely to be serious injury. In Michigan, a parent has a legal duty to exercise reasonable care to prevent the minor child from intentionally harming others or prevent the minor child from conducting themselves in a way that creates unreasonable risk of harm to others if the parent knows that they have the ability to control their minor, minor child and knows of the necessity and opportunity for exercising such control. Even before we had safe storage, there was always a legal duty that existed. That newly passed law has not no bearing on your legal duty that as a parent that you've always had. I said this before, there are two theories, two different ways to prove the same crime. If proven, one of these, both of them, are sufficient to establish the crime of involuntary manslaughter. 
And again, it's not necessary that you all agree on which theory has been proven, as long as you agree that the prosecutors proved at least one of those theories beyond a reasonable doubt. I want to stop before I talk about the evidence briefly. I want to know that everyone appreciates how much care and patience you've taken in listening. It's clear and it's obvious, and I thank you for doing that. There are, some, there are people, though, who think that the prosecutor's job is just to convict people. And that's just not true. It's our job to present you with the facts and tell the truth and to be advocates. And telling the truth sometimes involves showing you things no one wants to see. Sometimes our job requires to produce evidence and testimony and pictures and images that we don't want to show you and no one wants to see them. But that's, that's our job. That's my job. And it's not our job to sanitize, even though that would be easier. It's my job, and it's Mr. Keith's job, to present all the evidence to you and explain why we think the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Mark Keith told you when this trial started that any number of tragically small efforts, tragically small efforts, could have saved the lives of four kids. That it was foreseeable and it was preventable. And the evidence presented in the last five days has proven that, ladies and gentlemen. James Crumbly was presented with the easiest, most glaring opportunities to prevent the deaths of these four students. And he did nothing. He did nothing. He did nothing over and over and over again. And the evidence shows that. This case is not about holding James Crumbly responsible for what his son did. Again, if he knew exactly what his son was going to do, he'd be charged with murder. It's about his legal duty and his failure to perform it or to perform it in a, in a negligent way. You heard the testimony of Molly Darnell. She told you that the first thing she saw when she looked through the window and saw the gun being raised towards her was that there was no orange tip, which she had learned previously, she doesn't remember where, meant it's a real gun. That he aimed the gun at chest level and he locked eyes with her and the bullet landed six inches from her heart. Ed Wagrowski, who was a member of the computer crimes unit in the sheriff, Oakland County Sheriff's Office. He told you about what it, forensic uh, evaluation of cell phone um, analysis is. He was qualified as an expert. He described his involvement and in observations at the school that day. And he told you that he doesn't really respond to incidents like this. He was in computer crimes. No one comes into the office and says you have to respond to a critical incident, except that day. And you could tell that that had a great emotional impact on him. He watched hours and hours and hours of videos and images of that school that day to put together the evidence that we were able to present to you today and through the past five days. He reviewed all of it and he described and then showed you the path and the camera angles of the, of the shooter's path through the school that day. He also presented the messages between Jennifer and James Crumbly and the messages between their son and his friend. He told you that there were over 20,000 text messages between the shooter and that one friend he had. He also told you in one year, there were only 65 text messages sent between James Crumbly and his father. James Crumbly, who had either worked at home, was in between jobs, or had DoorDash. James Crumbly, who was the person he dropped, dropped his son at school every single morning. He told you that uh, the, 
the image of the, the gun that the shooter shared with his dad was deleted. He, we played the voicemail from the school on November 29th from Pam Fine, talking about his son searching bullets. He presented evidence that he was aware of that because Jennifer told him about it. She texted, did he tell you about what happened at school? James responded, yes. He shared with you the defendant's communications on November 30th of 2021. And, and an important, important to know, he was able to show you exactly the path that he took. Because of the cell phone data, some of you are probably surprised and a little concerned about how much somebody can actually know what you're doing, but it's a lot. And we know exactly where he was, what he did, who he talked to, and so we could trace his steps, which turns out to be some of the most critical evidence in this trial. He showed you through the DoorDash search warrant returns the locations of what James Crumbly was doing from the moment he left the school that morning until the moment he called 911. And only after he learned that there was an active shooter at the school did James Crumbly go home and look for the gun. Even though from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock he had four DoorDash pickups and passed his house many times. He was within minutes, many times. And you, play, you heard the 911 call by James Crumbly about 14 minutes after he arrived home and discovered that the gun was missing. Bob could tell us he testified and we showed you images of the hallway in that school when you processed the scene. And you saw pictures of that. And he told you that 50 fired, a total of 50 fired and unfired cartridges recovered, were recovered. And that the, the, the shooter fired 32 rounds and 18 were unfired. And we know where he got those 50. You saw that. It's when he pointed them out across the counter when he's with, with his mom standing a little bit behind her and said, two. You also know that James probably knew that because when he was at the substation and they asked about where this gun was, who, who's, who owns the gun, where's the ammo, he described it as he bought two boxes, referring to his son. Bob Catalis told you that those are rods placed in where bullet holes have penetrated that glass. And as you can see, and you saw other images, this was somebody who knew how to use a firearm. And Special Agent Brandon told you that's immediately what he observed. Those are shots if landing on a human being who killed him. Tammy Back explained in detail what her requirement is and what she did that day and that she knew James Crumbly because in June he came in and he bought two more guns, one for himself, which the evidence showed because he told Jennifer, what, what, how much did your gun cost? It was $300. And then there was another gun, which was his son's, a Derringer, and you saw the Derringer. She told you, she told you that she also sold him the 9mm on the 26th that his son was present with him. He stated he's had his eye on that gun. She told you that they sell um, a locking mechanism with each gun they sell, that he was provided the trigger lock statement, and that there was a cable lock with the Sig Sauer when he bought it, and it was provided to him, and the ATF pamphlet solely solely in existence to just warn people, once again, the dangers of firearms with minors. And she told you 
that regardless of what kind of mechanism they, they provide, they always try to provide a tool with anyone who purchases a firearm to make it safe. Sergeant Joe Bryan testified and introduced the, the video, the recorded statements of James in the substation. James' statements indicate he knew that his son had only one friend and that he left abruptly. He referred to the math worksheet that morning as some doodling on a paper. But that was after the shooting. Before the shooting, we know that he texted Jennifer Crumbly, WTF, when he saw it. Now he's downplaying it. It's just doodling. When asked how many rounds, he corrected Jennifer and indicated there were a box of 50 rounds that he bought his son. When asked where the gun was, James responded, it was hidden in an armor in the case, and the bullets were hidden in a completely different spot underneath some jeans. We're going to get to that. What James didn't say that day, no mention of any lock. No mention that the school wanted them to get their son help that day. And then when they put it within 48 hours. And here's something you never hear him say. You hear him say the gun was hidden. You hear him say that there was some doodling on a paper. That he, it was, he was a perfect kid. But here's what he never says. He never says, I don't know how we got it. Never says that. He never says, I, it, it was hidden, I, I, I have no idea, I just can't, I can't imagine how he got a hold of this gun. Never mentions that. Four kids just died, your son's in custody because he committed a school shooting, and not once do you say, how did he get the gun? And you know why he didn't say it? He didn't say it because he already knew. He knew his son had access to the gun. Christy Gibson Marshall, as we just talked about, heard gunshots, heard kids, saw kids running in a way that wasn't normal, went towards the shooting, identified and spoke to James Crumbly's son, and you saw that video, how she just stood there. Sean Hopkins. Sean Hopkins was a counselor. He testified that the shooter was looking up bullets the day before. He was aware of that. That morning he was told he was watching violent videos. And he told you that even in a 20 minute period of time, he was concerned enough to call parents and ask them to come to school right then. He told you that he said he needed help right away. He wanted them to get him some help right away. He told you that he was very concerned about the images, but his main concern was for the safety of the shooter. He told you he didn't want him to be left alone. And he said in that meeting, he never received relevant information from mom and dad. It was short. It was a very, very small period of time for a meeting that takes place when you have to come from your work. James was at the barn at the time. Go to your son's school. They were in and out of there in a very short period of time. He testified, they said, they, that, that just couldn't happen today. They had to work. Now, you've heard the testimony. You know what James Crumbly was doing as employment during that time. And, and, and defense counsel and I agree. That is a, a, a worthy endeavor, being employed regardless of how you choose to do it. But what's important to note is that DoorDash is not something that you have to, you can create your own hours. You can work when you want. It's not compulsory. You can work on the weekends. You can work anytime. Nick Ejak is the Dean of Students, testified that he was also at the meeting and that, that James Crumbly seemed irritated and that at the time they knew only a fraction of what was going on. 
No one told anybody at the school. They just purchased him a gun. Nobody, neither one of them, James Plumlee didn't say, you know what, um, we had this fight before. They mentioned about the fight the night before about grades, but didn't really discuss it as a big deal. Didn't really discuss the gravity of what it was like for his son, who had one social connection to the outside world, and that that person abruptly left with, and, and, and that his son found out because he just stopped texting him back. And that he was obviously so concerned and upset that he communicated that to his father because his father reached out to the friend's father. He didn't say that. He didn't say that the weapon wasn't secure. He didn't say that there had been signs that something wasn't right. Now, you may not like what the two people who were employed by the school and had contact with the Crumleys that day did. You may not like it. I don't like all of it either. But my job isn't to present to you the evidence that just looks good for my case. My job is to present evidence to you, all of it, because this is about the truth. But he doesn't get a pass because you don't think the teachers did enough. He doesn't get a pass for that. And the blame shifting is only meant to send a message I'm not accountable here at all, even though I bought the weapon, even though I didn't secure it, even though I never got help from my son, even though I could have taken him that day. Special Agent Brandon testified where he was when he heard about the shooting, what he did when he got to the school, how he traced the, the, uh, the gun, how he found out who owned it. He watched the surveillance. He, he noticed a couple things that were really concerning to him. One, it was somebody that was proficient with a firearm. He did what's called a combat load, which is unusual. The way his stance was, the shot, the shot he took that killed Tate. This wasn't somebody that wasn't experienced with a firearm. And logically, he wanted to know where this person was taught how to handle that weapon, where that that minor was taught, that 15-year-old, and he discovered that. He testified that the cable lock that was seen in pictures was this, was sold with the SIG, and it was the cable lock that was seen in the photos, and he then testified that they found that cable lock, shoved in another gun box in the kitchen in a cabinet behind a door. You also heard him tell you that the minute he looked at that drawing, he instantly noticed the gun. It wasn't just any old gun. It wasn't. And maybe you wouldn't have picked that up. But Special Agent Brandon did. And you know a lot who else would have known? The person that purchased the gun, James Crumbly. Detective Stoyak talked to you about the search. You saw pictures of the search and the house. You saw where the gun box and the ammo box were when they searched the house. It was on their bed. You also saw, you saw a map and learned a pretty small house. Pretty small. You learned he had two bedrooms. And you learned that in that master bedroom, which was small, there was the bed some nightstands, and two other pieces of furniture. The TV stand, where he found the two other weapons that were in a gun safe, a locking mechanism, with the, with the code set to 000, which is the default. Detective Story uh, uh, and, uh, and told you what others did. He never, ever, ever said that that SIG was locked. He said it was hidden. David Hendrick is in charge of the Fugitive Apprehension Team. Apprehension team. You learned what that is from two law enforcement officials. You learned that on the day the defendants were charged, they left a hotel 
in Auburn House, local, and drove all the way to Detroit in a building that is meant for businesses, not retail, people don't sleep there. And you heard what it was like when he arrived on the scene, when they were searching for James Crumbly and his wife. You heard through the, the, the body cam of uh, the Detroit um, officer, and you heard from um, Officer Hendrick, and you heard from Luke Kirtley that it was extremely loud. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of law enforcement, and most of them SWAT. Luke Kirtley told you about how James Crumbly was discovered that night. And the only reason he knew it is because it was all over social media with the description, the license plate, and picture of James Crumbly and Jennifer Crumbly. Why? Because they were charged. And even before they were charged, there was a lot of speculation about them being charged. Luke told you about what that building looks like, what it's for. It was normally there at night, not many people. That he shares a wall with that studio that they were found in. That that mattress they pulled in was out in the hallway. He again told you how loud and that it would have been impossible if he was in his unit not to hear that. Officer David Metzke told you that there were tons of officers, multiple agencies, and that they took a 35 pound steel ram to bypass multiple doors and they used it and it was loud. I think he testified we have the bigger guys do that. We saw through his body worn camera, the arrest of James Crumbly, who was laying on the mattress and seemed to be wanting to, to create the impression that he was sleeping. There's, there's a big problem with that. One, we know that shortly after Luke Kirtley went out to, the, uh, uh, to see the license plate, that he followed him shortly after, and he was away. And shortly after that, dozens and dozens and dozens of law enforcement show up on the scene. It's a first floor unit, the, the windows face that parking lot. Lights and sirens, media were there, Yet, he's lying on a bed as if he's sleeping. William Creer told you what they discovered. They had bought and purchased, they had purchased items with them, socks, new socks. They had um, clothing, they had food. Um, there was a whiskey bottle in the, in the trash can, there was ice. But here's the thing that was the most compelling about his testimony. The bag with the four phones that were turned off and $6,000 of cash was stored on the other side of the room from the backpack in a lid with, in a plastic bin with a lid on it. That is strong circumstantial evidence, which is used in this, in this country every day to convict people, that that was placed there in hopes that no one was going to find it. $6,000 cash, four cell phones turned off, which is odd if you're really trying to get up in the morning and go somewhere, and the alarm was set on one of those phones, but they were off. But what did, what did Ed Lugrowski tell you? He told you that you can't track a phone if it's off. You can't track it. You all learned, if you've learned nothing else, Turn your phone off if you don't want to be tracked because there's all sorts of ways. Lieutenant Willis testified. He showed you the bank records showing what they did when they found out that their son was charged and when there was talk of them being charged. He talked to you about the scene at Oxford High School. And it was a really detailed description of what it was like in that school, day, that school that day. Because hundreds and hundreds of law enforcement officials went to that school, some miles away. No one asked them to. They just drove there from all different parts. And so it was, it was Tim Willis's job to 
take all of those people who wanted to help and give them something to do and get the scene processed and start building a case. And answering questions, which is really what an investigation is about, way before you get to a prosecutor, because sometimes you never get to the prosecutor. Your job is to go where the evidence leads you. And there were things about this case from the very beginning that just seemed like questions that needed to be answered. And one of them was that gun was purchased four days earlier by James Crumley, who was the same person who was at the school that day. This is information they're learning immediately. They do a search warrant for the house and for phones, and they find out a lot of information. You saw the, you saw the video of the shooting. There's a reason we tell the media they have to turn their cameras off. We don't want those images out there. We don't want them to be on the internet. We don't want to encourage another school shooter. And we don't take any pleasure in showing it to you. But it's our job to know the truth and look at it and not look away. He told you how each of those kids died. Hannah was hit immediately after he left the bathroom. You saw the image and it was described to you. Madison Baldwin didn't run. She crouched down. There was a door four feet from her. And she put her hands over her head. And he walked right up to her and he shot her at close range. Kate was shot. I'm talking about that shot he took as he was coming in the door. He had his headphones on. He didn't even know what was going on. And Justin Schilling was shot in the bathroom after several minutes of being in there. there was, it wasn't immediately. She went into the bathroom, stayed there. Justin knew the shooter was there. And there was another student in there as well. You saw him running, Keegan. And he ran after James Crumbly's son shot Justin Schilling. Execution style. Defendant's son had access to and the use of this gun. It was preventable and it was foreseeable. You heard during jury selection, and you heard during opening, and if my prediction is you're going to hear it again, that this could be you. This could be any of us. This is what defense, this is their defense, that, for, that this, this could be you if you let your kid drive a car or leave with a sharp object. This couldn't be everybody. This couldn't be the person that takes their kid hunting. This couldn't be the person that buys a, a gun for their child to use, for their minor child for their use. That doesn't create a criminal charge, ladies and gentlemen. It couldn't happen simply because you purchase a firearm or simply because you let your kid drive a car. Beware of the claim that this could be you. Beware. It is not the case that finding James Crumbly guilty of gross negligence would result in a criminal char a charge for every parent who doesn't know what their child is doing at all times. And it is not the case that he was faced with the same normal challenges as parents that we all go through and suddenly found himself in a courtroom being charged with involuntary manslaughter. It is just not the case, and the evidence shows it. In June, the Derringer and the Caltech were purchased by James Crumbly. We know that that Caltech was left out 
unsecured with ammo. Why do we know that? You saw that picture and video and the one he sent to his friend, and you saw the text that accompanied it. But before we get to that, this is an image from the video that you saw. It was 12.30 at night. That is his cat, Dexter. Those are the, that is the shooter's cat. That magazine is loaded, and it was shoved on a table to load it. Not a proper or safe way to handle a firearm. And there is a round in the chamber, and the safety is off because red means dead. And, and Special Agent Brandon told you that. Even if James Crumbly was standing next to his son, that would still be an extremely dangerous way to handle a firearm. But, but we, we do know what happened. Because he told his friend when he texted it to him. My dad left it out, so I thought, why not? This is precisely the reason there's a legal duty in the state of Michigan to prevent your kid from harming himself or somebody else. All I need is my 9mm pistol, which I currently am begging my dad for. This is from his journal. First off, I got my gun. It's a six, six hour nine millimeter. Second, the shooting is tomorrow. I have access to the gun and the ammo. I have access to the gun and the ammo. Then we have defendant's own statements. James Crumley said it's a substation. James responded when it asked where the gun was. It was hidden in our armor in the case, and the bullets were hidden in a completely different spot underneath some jeans. Here's what he doesn't say. Never claims it was locked, never says it was inaccessible to his son, and again, never says or expresses any surprise on how his son got a hold of it. We know he took him to the range. We showed you videos and images of that. In fact, eight times we know that happened. We know that throughout June, July, August, September, October, by November, when he begged his dad for the 9 millimeter, and he actually did buy it for him, now he's at the point where he can instruct other people. It's James Crumbly's son that knows more about guns and, and when he takes his mom to the range. And how did he learn? James Crumbly taught him. He didn't take himself to the range with his dad. This is the shooter two days, one day, after the gun was purchased for him. He's packing it up. What don't you see? The cable lock. It's not even in the case anymore. And there it is. That's the cable lock that was provided that day with the pamphlet and with the gun. Just the day before, it's already out of the case. Here's where the other two guns were found in that bedroom, in the in defendant's bedroom in a locking a safe. In the TV stand. The code was 000. Important thing is that the SIG could not fit in, into that gun safe. Could not fit it. It's impossible. But the other important thing is you're hearing a claim that James Crumbly didn't think that he had to lock his weapon up. Okay. It's not about whether you locked the weapon. It's about whether you made it secure. And we already know he felt the need and understood his duty to lock the other two. Special Agent Brandon read to you the, the lines if, that, if he had opened it up, if he had read it, 
if he had believed it, those deaths could have been prevented. If he had just read it and just done, just, just did the simplest of things. This is the crime scene. There were 32 shots fired that day by James Crumbly's son. How do we know this was foreseeable? The shooter says in his journal, I have zero help from my mental problems and it's causing me to shoot up the You heard a lot during opening and um, during jury selection and opening about kids exaggerate to their friends. This is his journal. He's not sending it to a friend. He's expressing his state, which was desperate because he needed help. I want help, but my parents don't listen to me, so I can't get any help. My parents won't listen to me about help or a therapist. I can't even say with a straight face or even find a way to explain the rationale behind a 15-year-old that desperate writing that in a journal because he was exaggerating or lying. We have the text between James Crumbly's son and his friend about exactly what he wrote about in the journal. He hears people talking to someone in the distance. I actually told my dad, asked my dad to take me to the doctor yesterday, but he just gave me some pills and told me to suck it up. Again, teenagers exaggerating to make themselves look better, to, to impress None of these text messages to his friend make him look better. None of them make him look impressive. They just make him look desperate and sad and wanting help. I'm having bad insomnia and paranoia. I need help. I was thinking I could call 911 so I could go to the hospital. This was in April. But then my parents would be really pissed. I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctors tomorrow or Tuesday again. But this time, I'm going to tell them about the voices. And then on April 5th, like I am mentally and physically dying. What did James Crumley know? He knew the family dog had died. A grandmother had just died. His son's only friend, the one person he had any social contact with, abruptly leaving, can't even text him, knew his son was completely isolated, knew he had looked up bullets the day before, knew he was upset the night before, knew he had been watching videos that morning, violent videos, and then he sees that drawing. He sees that drawing that morning when he goes to the school, and what does it say? It says, help me. How many times does this kid have to say it? He says it in his journal. He says it to his his friend, and what is he saying? I asked my parents, I asked my dad. And then that isn't enough. He writes the words, help me, on a piece of paper. And his parents, James Crumley, is called to the school to see it. And what does he say? He says, we gotta go to work. He describes his son as a perfect kid, never gets in trouble. Well, you know, if you have a perfect kid that never gets in trouble, being called to the school abruptly that day and asked to come and saying your kid needs help is about 100 out of the 10 in terms of how troubling it is for a parent, if it's that unusual. He knows his son is proficient with guns because four days earlier, he, he purchased that weapon for him. This is James Crumley's son on the morning of the shooting, November 30th, being dropped off like every day by James Crumbly. And here's the worksheet. The thoughts won't stop. Help me. You have a picture of someone bleeding with bullet holes. You have a picture of the exact gun. It says blood everywhere. My life is useless. The world is dead. The 
This is the worksheet James Crumbly looked at when it was texted to him. This is the worksheet he sat and looked at when he sat in that counselor's office. Those are the words he was reading when his wife said, we can't do that today. We have to work. And he said nothing. And he leaves with a piece of paper with the names to call. This is what he was looking at. And there's the piece of paper. It took just one tragically small measure of ordinary care to avoid four deaths. James Crumbly failed to use ordinary care, which could have prevented the death of these four kids. Didn't stop at home to check to see where that gun was. Even though you're, you, you can't take him, which we know he could have, he could have driven around with him. He could have not done any DoorDash around until Jennifer comes back from work. He could have gone to see where that gun was. We know that in his door dashing, he was minutes away from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. He didn't search or ask to see the backpack. Never thought then to say, hey, can I talk to you out in the hall? Or, hey, where's that gun? Didn't ask his son where that gun was. Didn't check the journal, despite acknowledging he had one. Didn't lock and uh, uh, secure ammunition. Didn't lock or secure the gun. Didn't take his son home. Didn't take him to get this care that a counselor's telling you he needs. Didn't say, we bought him a gun four days ago as an early Christmas present. And didn't tell the school much relevant information at all. And Sean Hopkins told you that. He also didn't disclose any of the instances that you were shown throughout this trial that there was a message in March about him doing something stupid. Jennifer Crumley was concerned about it. James was always home. Is he home yet? Is he home yet? Is he home yet? Leave me alone. I have to work. He's fine. That's what he says. The incident about uh, giving him melatonin and him being worked up didn't tell him that he'd asked him for help and asked to go to the doctor, told him to suck it up, didn't say about the friend and how it was his only person he ever had any social contact with, that there were multiple guns in the home, that he was begging for a 9 millimeter. James Crumley never even shot that gun. He didn't even, he didn't fire it once. He had it, he purchased it on Friday. On Saturday, he was gone all day doing DoorDash. On Sunday, he was gone all day doing DoorDash. And that he wants you to believe he had this secure hiding spot. What, it was a, hide, it was a hiding spot for one day? We know it wasn't there on Saturday. We have the shooter taking pictures of it. And we know the cable lock isn't around. And we know Jennifer leaves. He's alone with his gun. Didn't say that it was identical to the one in the drawing. Didn't say he bought 50 rounds, rounds to take home. Expensive rounds to use at a range. This is the DoorDash information from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock and all of the times he passed that house. He was within minutes. We know that he was absolutely concerned about this worksheet until after the shooting in the substation where he says it was doodling. We also know that not once on any of his devices did we find any searches or information he was trying to get about firearm safety or how to um, make sure a minor doesn't get a hold of it, laws, any of it, until after the shooting. We know that at 10.37, he arrives at school. His son leaves at 10.52. They're gone by 10.53. At 11, he logs on to DoorDash. He completes four orders. He tells us in the 911 call and at the um, substation, he saw cop cars. We know that 12.51, the shooting starts, and we start to see students and parents, we heard, arrive at the mire. They're being told by dispatch that's where the reunification time is. James drops off his last order at 101. The email comes out, uh, out from the school at 109. At 111, 
James is in the minor parking lot. It's unclear exactly why. He calls his wife for 57 seconds. That's the call last 57 seconds. He's on the phone with her for 10 minutes and 19 seconds. He gets home at 1.20. During that call, she texts her boss, the gun is gone and so are the bullets. So we know that by 1.23, both of them had knowledge about that. He calls her again, 1.30 to 1.33, another three minutes. And finally, calls 911 at 134. There were 1,800 students in Oxford High School. There was one parent who suspected their son was the school shooter. And it was James Crumble. You know what that's called? It's called foreseeability. That's what that's called. missing gun. My son is at the school and we had to go meet with the counselor this morning because of something that he wrote on a test paper. And then I saw cops going somewhere. I wanted to go to the school, see what was going on. I heard about the active shooter and I raced home just to like find out. We don't have to discover or argue about whether or not he was put on notice that something was really, really wrong. He says it. He says it. He calls and he says, because of this meeting at the school and because I have a gun, I went home to look for it when he heard about the shooting. So the question of whether or not that did concern him, it's not a question. We know it concerned him because he said it. And then at the substation, and this is what he says. And somebody said there was an active shooter. I immediately freaked out because the situation. And after I saw all the cops, after I found it, it was an active shooter that went on this morning. I, and after what went on this morning, what's he talking about? He's talking about the meeting and the words on the paper. It says, help me, blood everywhere, with a picture of the gun at the bottom. So I raced home and I found the gun missing. We went into detail about what they, what James Crumley and his wife did after they thought they might be charged with a crime. And, and the evidence clearly shows what they didn't do. They did not turn themselves in. They did not make sure that they were in the area. They withdrew $6,000 and they went to Detroit and turned the car around so the license plate is not facing and didn't go out and buy that stuff themselves. They sent somebody else. And, and lastly, defendant conflicts his own statements. At the substation, the, the drawing was doodling. When he receives it from his wife, he's concerned, my God, WTF. 
He says at the substation, I immediately raced home and found the gun. And that's when I called you. I called you guys right away. It was 14 minutes after he got home. You think your kid has this gun. You know he does. You know he's really upset. You know the words he wrote. You suspect he's the shooter. And you wait 14 minutes to call 911? He doesn't know when the shooting started or when it ended. I think, I think he owed something to the parents and the kids in that school to, to at least try once he did figure out that he actually, the gun was gone, which any reasonable person would have known. But why lie and say you call right away? You call, you call after a 10 minute conversation with your wife. At the substation, he's a perfect kid, doesn't get into trouble, yet he was looking up bullets and yet they were called to the school and the drawing. He doesn't say that or what the drawing was really about. It was, it was, it's a downplaying situation. And then he says the gun was hidden. And again, never once, how, I, I don't know how he got it. Never once says that. James Crumbly had concerns that day. He knew something was wrong. He said it in his own words. And we know that because of what was on the drawing. And we know that because we know what his response was when he received the drawing. He kept those concerns private that morning. But he didn't just fail to inform the school. He failed to act. James Crumbly failed his son in, in a tragic way. You're not going to hear me say that's not true. But he, he didn't just fail his son. He failed Hannah. He failed Madison. He failed Tate. And he failed Justin. He failed to perform his legal duty to prevent these kids from being killed. And he failed their parents, too. And I ask that you find him guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Prosecutor. Ms. Lane? Yes, Your Honor.